Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me today... A uh, good friend from across the pond, Mr. Neil Killick. Neil, how are you, sir? I'm very good, thank you, Ryan. Pleasure to be here. You know, Neil uh, gave me that nudge I needed to get back on the microphone. Many of the listeners are probably aware. Uh, it's probably been a month and a half since a new episode's come out. A lot going on in uh, real life makes it hard to, uh, to jump online sometimes. But, Neil, thanks for the nudge. I've been looking forward to this ever since you reached out. No problem. Yeah, um, I've, I've just been listening to the show incessantly over the past few days in the car, and uh, it just made me realize what, what a good time I had on the show previously, and such great conversations, and the way that you, um, the way that you host with, uh, with a real impartial um, uh, approach is, is, is really, really quite impressive. So um, yeah, just very keen to have another, another conversation. Yeah, so no pressure, right? I guess I better do good on this one. <laughs> we will put the we'll host skills. <laughs> my, my skills are now put, being put to the test. We'll see how it goes. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to rise to the occasion. <laughs> Very good. So, so, Neil, of course, people know you from the, from the No Estimates conversation, from the management conversation. You, know, you and I have mm. talked a little bit about how we're kind of those unique people in the Agile community who actually have management responsibilities along with coaching mm-hmm. responsibilities, and that stuff gets interesting. A topic yeah. that comes up when you're managing people and when you're also trying to coach them is this whole conception of shuhari. Mm-hmm. I know from Twitter and, and some other conversations recently, you've really been um, hammering some some ideas there. When it comes to shuhari, what's, interest, what's, what's the interest level lately in that? What are you seeing in the community, and, and how are you applying that to your practice? It's a concept that... Um I guess I've known about for a few years, and I, I suppose I've never really thought too much about it. And then um, there was a, a, probably a, two or three years ago, there was there was a few things being tweeted about Shuhari, and I just found myself reacting quite negatively to to it. And and I think I think I think sometimes the way the concept is presented is um, a little bit well, what kind of how I said it at the time anyway feels a little bit patronizing to, um, I guess, you know, very uh, seasoned professionals in their, in, you know, in their craft. Um, we sometimes talk a little bit as if, you know, software professionals, software developers are these kind of people who, who haven't got a clue how to, how to work together and, you know, what processes to use and that they need this kind of shoe level teaching, you know, to, to follow the rules and, and, and basically sort of, you um, you know, just sort of take a, a well-defined practice and process and just run with it in order to sort of develop into the next stage where you can kind of start questioning the rules a little bit. Um, and, 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 and the thing is, there's nothing wrong with the concept at all. Because, you know, Alistair Coburn, we just recently had Alistair in, in my company. Um, he spent a day with us talking about the heart of Agile. And, you know, Shuhari is something that he talks about, um, you know, and it makes a lot of sense in terms of it's, you know, representing the stages of learning we go through with any particular new skill. Um, and and I, I completely subscribe to that, I, I think. But then someone um, uh, tweeted the other day and they actually wrote a bit of a blog post about this and about how it's actually um, it's uh, when it given that most of the time agile is is pretty much imposed on people in organizations and um, you know, teams aren't actually choosing to do Scrum or to, Agi- or to do Agile. And therefore, it doesn't really apply to say that these people are at shoe level because when you're at shoe level in a martial art, for example, 
you're actually choosing to be in the dojo with your master. You know, you're submitting to to them and to their, uh, you know, mastery of, of, of what they're doing. And you're, you're saying, hey, I'm here to follow the rules and to, and to really learn the basics. But that's not the case in, you know, agile software development teams. So um, it's just an interesting one. So it's kind of, I've got kind of gone up and up and down on the topic. I, 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 I definitely subscribe to the fact that it's an interesting model to apply to stages of learning. I just wonder about it, like how useful it is when we talk about it in a sort of agile context, when we're trying to, you know, I guess we're trying to win over people in, in terms of the benefits of agile. And we, you know, we want people to get the benefits of it because we know how, you know, how much I suppose joy and effectiveness it's brought to, brought to our lives. And I feel like sometimes we kind of baby people a little bit in the way that we present, present ideas. So that's kind of, I don't know, a bit of a brain dump there of stuff. <laughs> no, I, I have similar concerns because when this topic comes up and inevitably it does, it's typically seen as a measurement. And then mm. the first question that I get is, well, how do we know when we're Shu? How do we know when we're Ha? And how do we know when we're Re? And that's, there's not a checklist. There's not this. I, I wish there was a progression, like a test that we could do, like in the dojo, where, well, if you can do these four stances and these two kicks and these three punches and break five boards, you become a <laughs> yellow belt, you know? But it's yeah. not, it, it just doesn't work that way. So I, I always get a little nervous when uh, they start looking for the measurement. But uh, yep. you're right. From a learning pattern and perspective, it's interesting to to set that kind of expectation. But it's also a mindset measurement, which is also equally kind of troubling at times. It's you know then it leads into you know are you doing agile or are you being agile, which is a conversation yep. that most of the time I just I feel my soul dying a little bit when people start <laughs> that up. It's yeah, it's one of those where well you have to do it before you can be it. So stop hurting the people that are doing it. You know it's. Yeah, yeah, one yeah. of those things. But with Shuhari, aside from the questions around how do you know, I also get concerned very few teams ever get to re, and very few teams maintain that for, for any extended period of time, which means it may not be the goal. I, I just mm. question it. I wonder if, if teams get to the ha level and they're, de and they're delivering frequently, the customer's delighted. What's the incentive to go forward? Another issue with, with, with this concept is that, you know, if you're talking about Shu Hari in terms of, say, learning Taekwondo, um, you know what the end goal is in terms of um, the fact that you're learning Taekwondo. But when we talk about Shu Hari in, in a sort of agile context, you know, it's got to apply to a particular skill. And, and you know, an agile and scrum and all the things around it on one particular skill that we're learning it's a, you know, a massive body of knowledge and, you know, mindset and opinion and all of these other things. So, you know, I think often, I don't think we're being particularly explicit about, about what, what it is that we are going through these stages in. Um, you know, you've got to, to be, I would say to be at shoe level in something, you know, the prerequisites are A, you've got to know what that thing is that you're shoe are shoe in and B that you've got to actually want to be shoe in that thing and, and want to, you know, actually go through these stages of learning in that thing. And, you know, in, in the context again of software development, I just don't see teams sitting there going, okay, we're at shoe level scrum and we're, we're going to learn this. And then, and, and, you know, with the goal of becoming raw and then, sorry, ha and <laughs> like it, I, it, it just seems a, a bit of a fake uh, construct to apply on top of software development teams when actually, like you said, the goal is that we're delivering quality software, you know, to our customers. And I don't know if you can necessarily go through stages of learning for that. You, you just, <laughs> I don't know, you, you just uh, figure out what you're trying to achieve, you know, and inspect and adapt, inspect and adapt your way to it. I always come back to the concept of alignment. And this is what's been really eating at my brain lately, especially for the past couple months here where I've been off uh, off the air. But you know, when you're talking about Shu Ha Ri, I think the skill, if we had to pin down a skill, perhaps it is really the ability to create and maintain alignment. Mm. If you do that, and, and what I mean is, are are the team members aligned as a as a functioning unit, and then are they aligned to the customers' uh, needs, desires, goals, and then is delivering those outcomes that are being desired 
do we have the technology stack that's aligned to that? Do we have continuous integration? Do we have the continuous deployment? Do we have testing in place so that we can make changes safely? And so I keep mm. coming back to the idea that if we can align all of these stars and get them all in the right <laughs> order and, and space, this all becomes simple. So I wonder if that's the skill, uh, creating, mm. creating and maintaining alignment. Yeah. Oh, look, it's definitely, you know, as we, as we all know, it's hugely important to, you know, being able to play as a team and, and be effective, you know, in an organizational context and what have you. But, but again, I, 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 maybe I just haven't got particularly well-formed thoughts on this, but I just, you know, again, think of, you know, for example, um, you know, someone like Lionel Messi, you know, the best football or soccer player in the world. And at the end of the day, you know, he's, he's going to go through games and weeks and, and, and training sessions where he's doing the basics. He's, you know, they're, he, they're going, you know, going over the, just, just the basics of passing to each other and shooting. And, and it's not like he's reached some level where he's now just, he can float around and he's, and just, you know, he, he he's got nothing more to learn. I, I think there's, and maybe it's something to do with complexity here, but you know, I feel like there's never any end point of learning or improvement or, or anything like that. There's, wherever we get to, it's always we're always looking at the next thing that we need to learn or improve at, and there's no end. There's no end goal to that. So that's probably why, you know, I kind of struggle a little bit with the Shuhari concept when applied to software development, because um, it just doesn't feel like there is some end state that we're aiming for. Um, it, it, we're in too much of a changing dynamic environment, uh, you know, with individuals changing in the teams, with the the the, the system around our teams changing constantly. Uh, it feels like we're kind of res we'd be resetting all the time if we were trying to, you know, sort of deliberately go through stages of learning. Um, so yeah, I, I guess it's an interesting one because it's just not something I really think about when I'm coaching or. Um, or I suppose when I'm in a, in a team doing, you know, um, you know, working in any sort of capacity on product development, it, 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 I guess it's just not something that goes through my mind. Um, it, only, it only ever goes through my mind when I see someone tweeting or blogging about it and talking about it as as a thing within Agile. And um, I don't know. I I worry sometimes that you know I've seen um, at conferences. You know, and you get new people to Agile come along. You know, they've obviously been sent by their bosses to learn more about Agile, and so they can bring bring it back into their organisation. And they show up to some some sessions, and they start hearing about these concepts. And and you know, you can you can kind of almost see them shaking their head, going, "What the hell is this?" You know, like I want I want to be learning about you know Agile software development techniques, not about you know martial arts kind of learning concepts. I feel like sometimes we we um, we get a bit too uh, <laughs> too flowery and wishy washy in in the stuff that we talk about at conferences. Only about the fact that we're actually trying to the people who aren't familiar with these things and you know give them a give them a path in uh, you know into it. And I think it, I think it, it, I think these kind of things can often put people off. Um, what we're trying to help them with. So the, the conference scene is interesting because it, it typically is full of people who are newer to Agile. They've been sent there to learn. Uh, we start with these flowery concepts and these talks. Yeah. And they just get totally bad ideas. Um, <clears throat> and it was interesting because, mm. you know, I was recently down in Orlando at uh, one of the TechWell conferences, and they're actually very good about uh, getting beginner track activities in place and making sure there's a really good mix I think Lee Copeland puts together a really great program every year. And I had just given a talk. I went over and saw David Bernstein. Now, David wrote yep. Beyond Legacy Code, uh, a fabulous book, very much into or very much about uh, XP practices, coding practices, how to be a uh, an agile developer. And not a lot of people attended that talk. And it was one of the best of the conference. And I'm sitting there looking... You know, they're go people are getting mm. trapped into these more flowery talks, but here's a guy talking about nine critical skills for mm. an agile developer and, and couldn't get more than 20 or 30 people in the room. And I thought it was such a shame that, that one of these flowery talks probably pulled people from, you know, one of the most important discussions <laughs> that happened that weekend. Absolutely. And I, I was actually thinking earlier about the irony of um, how much time <laughs> we've invested in talking about no estimates, for example, 
um, um, you know, one of the key arguments from, you know, certain people in their estimates is, that, is about, you know, obviously reducing or eliminating estimation because it's a waste of time. And yet we, we invest so much time in talking about eliminating estimates. It's kind of a kind of ironic, ironic. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I always try and look for ways that how we can sort of demonstrate the, um, the dry uh, meeting organizational goals and being effective is what's driving us. I've got to be showing that, you know, the, the people, the you know, executives, senior managers, I've got to be showing them that my goal is to um, drive effectiveness in terms of, you know, how do we get better at meeting the organization's goals um, rather than my goal is to evangelize, you know, agile and um, particular ways of working and organizing teams and what have you. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm typically in your camp with, yeah, uh, this is a cute idea. It probably makes for a good sixty-minute talk, and some people can probably sell some workshops with it. But is it actually actionable? And are my stakeholders going to pay for such concepts? And the answer is probably no. Mm. So, and that's the hardest part for people, I think. You know, interestingly, though, you know, when we talk about people following the Scrum Guide, and this is just purely from my own experience, but I've actually never ever worked with a team or come across a team that follows the Scrum Guide in my entire career. But we, we, I hear a lot of people talking about teams that are just blindly following the Scrum Guide. Um, so they must exist, but I, it, it, it's just interesting that, you know, I've been, and look, admittedly, I'm fa actually fairly new to the Agile scene. I've been working with, you know, Agile Scrum team since uh, about 7, 2008. So, you know, pretty, pretty new to the game, I suppose. But um, I've just never come across it. In, it's, in fact, it's the opposite. I, I find that teams ignore, um, and organizations ignore the Scrum Guide and, and, and therefore aren't actually doing anything close to Scrum. So it, it, it's uh, interesting to hear that, that um, you know, people talk about teams <laughs> following the rules. Because I just, in fact, I, I ritually see teams not wanting to follow rules and actually, you know, um, saying the opposite, saying we don't want to do Scrum because there's too much planning and um, you know uh, there's too much sort of uh, I suppose process in it, and we want to just focus on you know delivering software and you know it, it's kind of like an abandonment of rules rather than a, a following of them. I don't, yeah. I don't know what your <laughs> your experience. But. No, I, w I would love to find a team that just followed the rules for a while and uh, got some experience in working in in such a way and moving <laughs> yeah. forward. So. I, I, I agree with you. It's typically it, an interesting experience I had in as a as a younger scrum master. You know, at one point I, I reached a level of frustration with the scrum mm. team, and I finally said, "Look, raise your hand if you've actually read the scrum guide." And out of a an eight person team, two people raised their hands, and I was one of them. <laughs> and so you're you're, wa you're watching <laughs> this play out, and it's like, "Come on, guys, it, we've got to at least read the document." And uh, so I think it's a common, it is a thing. Uh, but I think it's also important to remember our stakeholders, oh, yeah. they're not paying for us to be, to, to do scrum. They're not paying for our stand up. They don't care about our retro, you know? And so those are never the goals. Like as a, mm -hmm. as an agile coach, as a, as a practitioner, I need to become very good at those things and at facilitating and conducting them. But our stakeholders are not paying for that. It's always delivery centric, and I, I wonder, have you seen where teams get so caught up in the practices or the ceremonies or or story points or or whatever that they forget about the fact that the only thing that matters is really delivering uh, the value back to the people paying the bills. I have, I, I have seen that, um, uh, and. You know, often, often it um, it stems from again teams in situations where they're kind of they're kind of being coerced into working in a scrum like way. Um, you know, and, and actually to that point, you know, thinking about can, can I actually think of any teams that just follow the scrum guide like willing you know willingly? Um, I'm just trying to think of teams that have actually willingly said we want to do scrum. Again, it, uh, it's um, you know the situations we t we typically end end up in are situations where we've you know been hired as a scrum master, 
Um, so the decision's already been made to do scrum, and you know, and most likely the decision wasn't the teams; it was you know their bosses um, uh, in the, you know in the organisation. Um, so, you know, if you really think about it, I, I think the major problem we have is that is that teams aren't actually willingly work, you know, choosing how they work. They've kind of they're kind of being told to work agile or work scrum, and then to you know, then given these kind of delivery pressures within that and then, and then, but then also expected to sort of, you know, improve their performance within that. But they, because they haven't willingly taken on that, um, you know, that way of working that then, you know, they're not gonna, they're not going to be inspecting and adapting and, you know, cause it's just not, it's not something that they've actually explored and said, "Hey, this is this is how we want to work." You know, this is how we want to deliver deliver our uh, deliver the software we're being asked to deliver. They're just doing it. And so, it, I don't think I think of all of these things um, about you know we talk about the goals of a team and 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 you know how to get better and high performance and what have you. But if if the starting point is not one of willing, you know, willingly participating in a particular way of working. I don't think we can expect, you know, any any kind of um, improvement in the team. So there are ways that we can actually get there, though. And one of them, uh, I know that team agreements and working agreements are, are a great way to get started. It can help set the stage. But what I have found is an area yeah. ripe yeah. of compromise is actually the definition of done. And I don't know if you've used this tool to kind of get buy-in. Yeah. But uh, I think it's a wonderful practice. Well, first of all, I mean, if you're doing Agile and you don't have a definition of done, I'm a little bit worried. But um, I think that's an area where teams have made compromises where they've kind of adjusted to the uh, being voluntold that they're doing ag- Agile, not volunteering. Just an area where they can kind of put yeah. their stamp on it. How have you used the definition of done to kind of bring teams around and to perhaps get them back on the uh, proverbial Agile bus? So it's interesting you mentioned there about definition of done, and you know if you're if you're agile, you're not doing definition of done. You're worried because <laughs> um, uh, I think it's again it's one of those topics that that does have its own opinions around it. Um, so obviously it comes from Scrum in particular um, around having um, you know, and it's all based around you know again very solid principles of having a shared understanding. Uh, not just within the team, but within the wider within the wider sort of business group as well. About um, you know, for a particular piece of um, well, for every piece of software that we're building, what does you know what does done look like in terms of our um, you know and you know environment where the, where this software ends up in terms of you know deployment um, and what you know what functionality we're expecting you know. Uh, Ex- has this software met the you know acceptance criteria? So does it actually do what the the customer or the stakeholder expects it to do? You know these are all solid um, solid reasons to have a definition of done. Um, but there was an interesting, and I've used you know when I've worked with teams as a scrum master, you know it's something that we really talk about because obviously we want to find ourselves in a position of momentum where we're actually we're, we're actually able to deliver things and then move on and, and get that feeling of uh that we're actually you know um delivering something useful and, and moving forward rather than sort of just keep working on something which is going to be, uh, attract more scope to it and um you know and then d- delay the actual you know uh, delivery of, of that piece of software so it's a, it's a it's a useful tool, but you know, someone tweeted the other day about that it's you know, and I've seen a few tweets over the years about about this. You know, people people use the argument that you know, software is never really done, and so to 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 use the the um, you know, I, I suppose they see uh, that being abused in terms of you know, it's a way of um, a way of sort of you know getting again getting people to just get stuff done rather than to actually think about what it is we're building and and the value of, of what it is we're building uh, i've sort of had a bit of back and forth on this and you know i sort of i said well <clears throat> i think when we took you know in the definition of done when we talk about done 
I think what we really mean is good enough for now. So we kind of know that, you know, when we're doing agile and iterative software development, that we're, we're actually willingly saying that we are going, um, we're willing to actually go back to that same piece of code, that same feature, and to iterate over that feature. So we don't actually, it's done, <laughs> as in we're never going to touch it again. We mean it's good enough for now to, to, to call that a, a, a you know, a, to call that progress and that we can move on. And I kind of like that. I, I use an, a, one of my uh, poor analogies that got shot down after I used it, but I still think it's kind of okay um, that we, you know, I, I said it's kind of like chores, where, like household chores where we, we you know, we, I say the value, but knowing that, you know, in a couple of days' time, I'm going to have to do it again, right? It's, so it's never actually really done. It's good. I've done enough for now. It's, uh, it's good enough for now. I've made progress. I've cleaned up what I need to clean up for now. Um, I can now move on to, you know, unloading the dishwasher and, uh, you know, washing the windows. Um, but, yeah, so it's, uh, again, it's, it's one of those, um, let's say, it's, what, it's what useful practices that probably gets abused in, in, in places and people don't, uh, don't really understand what it means and, therefore, it causes controversy and, um, and, and is often deemed as another way, you know, another form of coercion, I suppose. Which is really unfortunate because this is a tool that was designed uh, to create transparency. Mm. So it, it was really, at least in, in my readings and in my experience, it's a tool that the team uses to communicate back to their product owner, their stakeholder, the person writing the check, uh, what exactly working software means. And so what, what we're saying is, well, this, this code is, is unit tested and we have behavior driven testing behind it and we've used standard coding practices and we've used these libraries and we've, you know, all these things are present <clears throat> so that when a, a stakeholder looks at a, a working piece of software, they know the, the assumptions behind it. And, and I've always thought that that was an interesting, you know, because we've all been in the demo where there's uh, a person sitting back in the office making data move and then it shows up on the screen and it looks like the vaporware is real. But it, mm. it really, in reality, the the demo was a was a fraud, and you know the stakeholders are duped, and and checks are signed, and and things move on. And you know I can remember early in my career situations like that. The definition of done I felt like was designed to work against that, just to say, look, this is what it means when we show you software. So to hear teams are being abused by that, really disheartening. Well, uh, to be <clears throat> and just to be clear, this is something that I've never really seen definition of done as a negative in my experience um but it is something that people do every now and then it pops up in my feed that there's some you know kind of i don't know some controversy about definition of done that you know that we should abandon it you know it's a unnecessary stage gate or it's uh it perpetuates this notion of software being done when it isn't actually done you know and i I suppose if again, if I'm if I'm to put my sort of devil's advocate hat on, and you know, I think about how we typically end up using agile in, you know, I suppose organisations that haven't necessarily grasped agility, um, and you know, the reason for doing agile, we we are able to um, you know use empir empirical process because we are. Um, because we're building quality into our software and we're delivering these increments of, of working software, we say, well, th you know, this is our progress in terms of what's done. And therefore, we can kind of project that forward to, you know, talk about, you know, what that means in terms of the, the overall goal or objective of what we're trying to deliver. So, you know, done means, so done is that increment of progress towards that. But, but, but if you actually think about that, you know, not... I spoke about this a few years ago when I was doing my whole no estimates um, roadshow. <laughs> in that, I find that we can use agile very effectively for you know empirically measuring progress towards our goals. Henrik Nyberg describes this beautifully in his, in his agile, um, sorry, his product owner in a nutshell video, where he talks about you know if we've got a fixed scope variable cost uh, variable time question or a fixed time variable scope question, and you can kind of draw these lines on your burn-up chart and and you can answer answer the question based on what's being asked using this projection of doneness 
for me, I, I still think that's not really getting the essence of agile and agility. It's still, I, I, I still think it's just a, a, a slightly better way of managing a project rather than it being um, embracing agile for what it actually is, which is really about emergence and surprising outcomes. And we still, we, we still kind of use these things to gain a sense of predictability and certainty around what we're doing rather than really embracing the uncertainty. So to call something done it's almost it's almost like we're we're admitting that we we're putting boundaries around uh, around what we think is done so that we can measure progress towards bigger bigger outcomes of done so so it, i can kind of i can kind of empathize a bit with the, with the argument because it does kind of it's these these little these language things that we use in in agile software development a lot of them a lot of them seem to contradict the whole essence of what agile is supposed to be Right from the start, we say, because products are never really done, this is why we, we, we actually should embrace an agile way of doing things because, and then just keep building the best possible outcomes and, and keep delivering value until there's something more valuable to move on to. So that whole concept removes the idea of done. We're, we're, we're done is when we don't know we, when we're going to be done. We're done when enough value is being delivered and there's some higher value opportunity has come along. I think a lot of the things that appear in the typical definition of done could get moved over to a very basic working agreement, and a lot yep. of the confusion would just dissipate. Yep, yep. And I'm a big fan of that. I The idea that we're done, because I, I liken software development back to craftsmanship, not really a science. And so mm. if you ask, a, ask an artist when their painting's done, it's, well never really done or as george lucas you know the the new star wars movie is coming out this weekend uh, mm. here in the u.s and you, you ask lucas or a director you know when are the films done and well never but they've got to get them out the door at some point and so there's yep. there's less value in continuing to work on it than there is uh, getting those ticket sales so they move forward and, and even george yep. lucas went back and toyed around with my childhood and the star wars movies three or four times so um, yeah you're never done. It's just like you said, the value isn't, you know, good friend of the show, Tim Oniger, I think likes to say, was the juice worth the squeeze? (laughs) And at at some point the juice isn't worth the squeeze and, and you move on to the next thing. And yeah, he's, I think he's a big fan of oranges. So (laughs) that's how that works. But, uh, yeah, that's done for now. Yeah. And we move to the next thing, but someday perhaps we come back, but, you know, it's interesting that those things pop up in your feed. One thing that I'm sure pops up in your feed all the time, and you mentioned it, so it's fair game, is no estimates. And yep. uh, I know that, you know, between you and Woody and Vasco, you know, you guys are considered the big three. But I've always wanted to ask you this, and if this question is a little too direct, I apologize. But if you could do it all over again, would you stay out of the no estimates conversation? <laughs> that's uh wow um n- no no uh because um the, the i suppose that the 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 stuff that i went through in terms of the my thought process of learning about different ways of thinking about um estimation and then starting to blog about my thoughts on hey sh- should we even be should we even be estimating software projects? I think my first blog post was called exactly that. Should we estimate software projects at all? Um, and it was really a dump of my thoughts, um, you know, given that I'd now really begin to understand and embrace what agile really means. Uh, and then, and then you're, because when you then, you know, start to grok agile, you then start to question some of the, I suppose the practices and, and, you know, things that go on around that, that don't seem to necessarily fit in with that way of working. So going through that thought process and then really starting to form some ideas around that and, and blogging about it and having great conversations and learning so much from people, uh, on both sides. I learned a lot of stuff from, uh, Glenn Alleman, who's, you know, one of the, one of the main critics of the, you know, the no estimates, um, hashtag and stuff that's been going on i suppose under that name over the over the years um there, there were some you know frosty engagements uh, within that there was a lot of good stuff as well but from both sides you know he i know he he asked me to share a lot of my stuff with him and 
and I, you know, I read a lot of his stuff and, you know, found some kind of middle ground and learning, even though it doesn't seem that way on Twitter. There was, you know, outside of that, a lot of sort of mutual, I suppose, respect and, and learning. There was two or three bad things that went on. And, and to be honest with you, there was one point where I just, I, I just, got out of there completely because I was it was just beginning to drain my time and energy and and nowadays I I actually stay pretty clear of it I, I dip in every now and then and it's quite entertaining to have a have a read of what's going on in there and I'll occasionally um, reply to one of the tweets or I'll put the hashtag on one of mine but um, I'm definitely not really very active in there anymore but no, look, I, I'm 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 not really the kind of person who have, re- have regrets about anything. To be honest, I think everything is a, a learning experience, and I, I, I still get <laughs> I still get dubbed the no estimates guy, and you know, which can which <laughs> which can be it can be problematic, particularly when you're you know you're sort of applying for head of engineering roles in companies, <laughs> and you know you, you, you're speaking to execs and they're asking you about this stuff, and you're trying to sort of say, look, I didn't really mean. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> there have been, I suppose, negative sides to it, but but I think overall it's been a very positive thing for my career, and I'm happy that you know I hear countless stories of teams and individuals around the world that have benefited from stuff that I've written, and they're applying it in their day to day, and it's helped them improve the way they work, and it's all positive from my point of view. That's a great way to look at it. In the it, it was really the journey, not the end result. Yeah, uh, you know, it it, it puts you on this path. And, and you learned a lot. And I, I think the no estimates discussion, you know, even if you come out of it saying, well, it's all estimation and, and so we're still going to estimate and it's all, all nonsense, that's fine. But it forces you to question commonly held viewpoints, practices. And I think if you really take a hard look at the topic <clears throat> and the arguments, uh, first of all, you do gain a lot of respect for people like Glenn. Mm. Um, he is a giant in the estimation field. Yeah, um, and he, he, the work he does, I'm not nearly smart enough to follow many of the the, the statistical models and the math that he applies to projects and yeah, you know, but he does it very well, and so you learn a lot from there. The things that I could grok, I, I definitely pulled in and have used in certain places, mm. but I've also been able to learn just what uh, that next step along the agile path, right? That you know, it's not just a scrum process. It's there's there's things here that these ideas are bigger than, than any one process or framework. And mm. I think having these discussions and, and entertaining these ideas help us get further along. I mean, you know, look at Woody Zool and his agile axioms and, and yeah. the, the, the things that have come out of, you know, his no estimates talks, his mob programming practices. Yeah. You know, these are bigger ideas. These are next level ideas. And I, and I think all of these conversations lead up to that. You know, yeah. even Vasco, his book, his work, you don't have to agree with all of it, but if you can pull out a single idea and it, and it leads to, to you having a little more insight in what, into what it means to deliver software, yep. I think that's valuable. Absolutely. Uh, and um, look, I, 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 think, I think one of the big curly issues around this no estimates uh, conversation and why I kind of, I, I suppose, got quite uh, in, in interested in the beginning is, you know, I've kind of said from the start, it's not really that much in my, like, funnily enough, it's not really that much about estimation in terms of why I'm interested in the conversation. It's more about the the dysfunctional behaviors that uh, surround the practice of estimation. So being careful here not to say that they're caused by estimation, but the when we, when we in our um, teams and, and in our organizations, we you know, when we sort of embark on this, um, there's this new thing that we, it's a new idea that we want to um, get off the ground. You know, the first question is, right, let's put some estimates around this baby. It's like suddenly everyone goes into high alert mode. So like, the, you know, the stakeholders are going into the mode of, you know, let's see how high this estimate is going to come out of because if it's, if it's too high, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be a viable project. And then the developers are going, right, we've shot ourselves in the foot so many times. I've got to make sure that I don't give too low an estimate in case the stakeholder goes, oh, yeah, that sounds perfect. And then that gets locked in and I end up uh, now in a situation where I'm held to, to what I say. So this kind of these weird mind games go on and, and the result of that is actually not good outcomes on either side. You know, um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the dates or the, the, the estimates that people are going to come out with are going to be not actually representing 
the reality of what they really think uh, because of the culture that are in. And it's all very well to say, well, this is bad management or it's, you know, in the culture, a bad culture or whatever. But the thing is, it, it is a prevailing problem. Every organization I've worked in, no, in fact, I would say every single organization I've worked in has some weirdness going on around the whole estimation thing. And it's a, it, it's a game. And, it, and, and I think it's, I think a lot of it is around the people at the top of companies. They are there for a reason and they, they're there because they like making decisions and they like having a certain element of control. They uh, have very strong opinions about what is right and what is wrong. When we talk about a healthy est estimation environment where people are kind of collaborating and, you know, calling out assumptions and then, you know, revisiting those regularly, I just don't see that happening anywhere. What I see is a very much kind of it's a it's a, a request response situation i'm someone is going to request an estimate a response comes back and that information will be taken away and used in whatever way that that requester needs to use it there is no revisiting and realigning and all these other things just doesn't happen if it did happen fantastic when i try and help teams with this with with, with the when I, when I, like, ironically i spend a lot of my time helping teams get better at estimation meaning not get, not getting more accurate with it but getting being being able to provide estimates that are you know that have assumptions built in and uncertainty built in and making them more collaborative and understanding the background to the request and all these kind of things if you're doing all of those things then you know, it's healthy and, and harmless and, and actually probably useful. The, the, the problem is there is, a, there is a dysfunction around, you could call it bad, and Glenn calls, calls it bad management. He calls it the root cause of, of all of these problems are bad management. And my answer back was always, okay, but <clears throat> what, what can we do with that? Like, what's the next step? If the root cause is bad management, what, what do we do now? But we can't just tell people, here is how you get better at estimating, go off and kind of learn that and do it. We've got to actually address it. You know, you can only you can only influence what you can influence. So, in terms of like software development teams, how do they influence this situation for the better? And 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 this is what I try and do is try and help help the teams when they do get asked for the for estimates, help them provide something that more meaningful, and also help the requester understand the problems underlying what normally happens with estimation, and trying to get them to frame the value and the impact and the the impact of not doing this work and all. All of this information that would not normally be revealed to the lowly developers, but actually by revealing that stuff, it, may, it helps everyone make better decisions. So that dysfunction, you know, th this kind of whole area of dysfunction exists. And this is why the conversation is still, in my mind, it, this is why it's still raging and why it's still so relevant and important. And I don't think it will really ever go away. And, and as I say, it was never really about not estimating, to be quite honest. I, I know that. You know, Woody's angle is very much about that, and and Vasco's angle is more about forecasting rather than doing estimation rituals. But really, again, it, it's not really about either of those things. It's more about the environment, the trust, the dysfunction, the 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 inability to deliver what the business wants in a quick enough way. Um, now that they've seen, they've had a taste of agile, and they've had a taste of thing, you know, features getting delivered every fortnight. It's now they now want more. Because the people who run our companies are always going to want more. We're never going to hit, hit, a, hit a point where they say, right, guys, you guys have been awesome this year. You're as pretty much high performing as we could ever wish to have. Just keep on going next year. That just will never happen. There will always be a, a push for more. That will always be interpreted as um, this, we need to get more stuff out the door and we need to trim down our estimates so that we can hit our targets. And I call it a you know a vicious cycle of um, distrust, I think, Um Back, you know, when I talked about this a few years ago, I think that is a a beautiful framing of, of the topic, and uh, and I really appreciate you doing that. I think that's one of the better explanations I've heard in a long time around what it, what no estimates is to you, what it has meant to others, and and how it can benefit people, even if you end up disagreeing. And so I really appreciate appreciate you doing that. Maybe with these last few minutes, if yeah. you just want to. Uh, to wrap up, there's anything you've got going on, anything like you'd like to plug, website, blog site, Twitter feed. Let's get that out there because I think people are very interested in the, the perspective that you bring. Again, agilist, big idea guy, management, you know, all of these things coming together, it is a unique blend. And, uh, and I think it makes your blog and your Twitter feed uh, very interesting at times. And so I'm sure people would love to follow you if you can give them uh, ways they can follow you or reach out. I think they would uh, very much appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Twitter is 
is a good place to get me um, at Neil underscore Killick. I do have a blog, um, neilkillick.com. To be honest, I haven't actually written a post for a while, which is pretty bad. I probably need to make a New Year's resolution to to start um, uh, getting in the flow of that again because I, re- I really do enjoy it. But um, but look, it's uh, hopefully there's some good stuff on there to um, you know that discusses a lot of the topics that we're discussing. We've been discussing today. But yeah, those are the best ways to reach out. Reach out for me. Reach out to me. You know, th- there's a number of blog posts that you've done that have had a great influence on me. I'll pick out two or three of my favorites. Get them in the show notes to give yeah. people a, a place to start with you. But, yeah, sure. Uh, I do highly recommend Neil's blog. It is a, again, you don't have to, here's the thing that, um, here's what it is, Neil. And I, and I wonder if you agree with this. Mm. There's this concept out there of winning and losing when it comes to ideas. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, I don't believe ideas are zero sum because they're infinite. Yeah. You can have a new idea every moment. Uh, it's okay for many of them to, in fact, most of mine are wrong. Uh, but when I do hit on a, a good one, it. You know, I try to run with it, but, um, you know, just just enjoy the ideas. And yeah. Even if you disagree with it, take something from it. Even if it's a, a corollary idea or if it's an anti-pattern, whatever it is, you know, yeah. take that inward, internalize it, make it part of your agile theory yeah. and, and move forward. And, yeah, I, and I think that's a way to do it. Absolutely. And, and, um, and I would add to that as well that, you know, we should apply you know, scientific methods to this as well. So if you don't agree with an idea, um, rather than just, you know, reject it, actually test it, you know, actually um, gather your own data and, and experiment with it. And and I know, again, for some reason, no estimates advocates, like, recoil at the idea of people experimenting with this stuff. But but actually, the way I got into the no estimates thing in the, in the first place, I actually used to argue with um, Vasco about, about this, and I would actually say, you know, how can you, you know, how can you ditch story point estimates? Um, you know, we need them at the, you know, for the bigger chunks of work. You know, it doesn't make sense to just say count stories because what about the the bigger scale uh, parts of the backlog? And uh, I guess like what you'd call, what you'd now call a critic, um, uh, no estimates critic. Um, but what I did was I listened to what Vasco had to say, and then I it was very easy to run a safe to fail experiment because you know the project I, I was happened to be managing at the time using story point estimates. So all I started doing was starting to measure the story count as well, which I just previously wasn't doing. And, I, and I th- okay, well, what I'll do is I'll start measuring this, and I'll see if what Vasco is saying has any kind of legs, and you know, in, in our context. And, you know, after about three or four months of data gathering and, you know, realizing that he was spot on, that actually count of the stories was pr- providing us with, you know, actually better accuracy for forecasting. And it, and it was just following the same pattern trend as the story points. You know, the team, the team were in the mode of just pretty much everything was a three because, because, you're, breaking, because you're breaking stuff down as a team naturally because you work in two-week iterations. Everything kind of tends to average out in terms of size. The law of averages and law of large numbers kicks in. So it, it becomes less about the individual items and more about the, the um, collection of items and the trends. Um, and I actually, <laughs> I distinctly remember, I actually then um, went back to Vasco and I just, I simply tweeted, you were right. That was really what then triggered my interest in exploring it further. And, and then I sp- <laughs> somehow became one of the big three, as you, as you uh, introduced me earlier, <laughs> of, no, of no estimates. So yeah, it's an interesting uh, journey. But like, you know, I suppose the message there is that I didn't just dogmatically have an idea and then just stick with it and run with it. I actually tested, tested other people's ideas and then um, listened to all sides of the argument. And then my, my, my um, opinions have definitely fine-tuned over the, over the years as well. Um, you know, I wrote a post on... Um, uh, the scaled agile framework a few years ago called the horror of the scaled agile framework and it was a real kind of rant piece at the time but you know again since then my my views have changed um and to be honest with you it's kind of like with code if you look back on your code from you know a couple of years ago and and you're you're happy with it there's something wrong it means you haven't moved on you haven't learned and I often read my older blog posts and a lot of a lot of my old self I still agree with but then there's other things that I I've sort of learned more about and moved on with so I, I think that's that that for me is what the essence of, of it's what it is all about and, and like you say if people are rejecting ideas and they just want to win the argument then we're not really applying which we're, we're uncovering better ways of uh, working you know we're not applying it to our own ideas and our own mental models and 
I, I always try and challenge my my mental models and and um, you know and see which things I really really genuinely do believe are principles that are embedded in me and other and other things which are things I need to have open to scrutiny. Um, you can only really do that by putting out those ideas and testing the boundaries and you know putting it. Sometimes you put the extreme side out just to see if there's enough. You know, if people can come back with a, a good argument as to why that case is wrong, then you can then start to sort of reform and, and learn from that. Um, if, if there is no good comeback to that, then you go, well, maybe I'm on something here. Maybe we do need to get extreme with this. So, yeah, it's uh, it's good to read as many opinions as you, as you can. And, um, and, and, and interestingly, if something if you find some, yourself disagreeing with something, that's where you need to probe further and uh, try and learn more about it. If we just if we just carry on reading the stuff we agree with. We're never going to grow. Well, Neil, I can't think of a better way to end the show, so I think we'll end it here. I just want to thank you again for for uh, sharing your morning with us and uh, for being here for sharing these ideas and just all great stuff. And uh, thanks for pulling me out of podcasting retirement. I wasn't sure when I was going to when I was going to get to record next, but uh, this is great, and I can't wait for the next time that uh, we get to speak. Was it, was it like one of those movies where you've, you know, you've come out for just one last, you know, one last week? <laughs> <laughs> no, we are back. So we are going to get back on a good schedule. Like we talked about uh, before the show. Yeah. Uh, life, life has a way of taking over hobbies and, um, and, well, and the fun stuff. So, well, uh, you know, and I, I, I just, just to close, I, I think you're, you know, you'd be doing a disservice to call this a hobby because it really is a fantastic po- podcast. You know, I, I, I you know, I listen to only a handful of, of agile podcasts, and this one is definitely the best. Um, the, you know, the content, the the level of intelligence, and, and the the way that ideas are framed, the guests you have on the show, um, it's really a fantastic listen. So that's why I wanted to just be involved in it again. And um, so, thank you for allowing me to do that. Well, thank you, Neil. I, I appreciate those words, and uh, the show's only great because people like you uh, come on and join me, so I uh, certainly appreciate that. And to all the listeners out there, thank you for being patient. Uh, life certainly did uh, jump in the way of this podcast for, for a few weeks, but we are back. We have many guests, many great guests like Neil lined up. Uh, we're going to have some really fun shows out there very soon. Thanks for listening, everybody, and have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.